Welcome to another episode of Silver Lining for Learning. We are very delighted to have with you and us today uh, two very special guests who are going to talk to us about educator simulations. We've got Sarah Dexter, she's an associate professor at the University of Virginia. And we've got Ken Spiro, who is the CEO of School Sims, formerly Ed Leadership Sims, and they will be telling us a little bit more about their work. Ken and Sarah, nice to have you with us. Chris and Punya, as always, this is a delight to co-host with you. Um, hope everybody's been having a good week. Um, Ken and Sarah, why don't we start off by just explaining to people what do we mean by a sim? What is a sim? What do they look like? How do they operate? What are we talking about here? Ken, you want to get us started? Uh, sure. Uh, it, thank you, by the way. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to engage with you all. Um, so obviously simulations, there's no real taxonomy in the field. So simulations mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, but I'll tell you what I think about when I do simulation. But fundamentally, so I do computer-based oriented. So in terms of scalability, in terms of flexibility, um, that's what uh, the, the modality that I would utilize. Obviously, there are other ways of doing it. But for me, a simulation encompasses five or six different key components. The first aspect is that we want to create a realistic, so if, we, if we've simulated a problem of practice, right? So we've simulated something and we want people to have an experience with it, right? We know that experience is the best teacher. So what we're looking to do is create an experience that we can do in a safe place. So the first thing we want to do is create a context, right? The, this, the simulation should take place in a realistic, recognizable context. Uh, we like to harness the power of the narrative of stories because we know how engaging stories can be. And so we look to be able to create a context because much of what makes decisions difficult often is the context, right? They're contextual issues. These are issues that it's not like I can give you a recipe to follow and do these six things in this order and you'll get it right, right? These are things that require thoughtful responses and often context is important and being uh, contextually aware, uh, rec re being able to recognize in the context what's important, that's the first step. The second thing we want people to do is to be able to actually have to, or be placed into a situation where they have to make choices. They have to make decisions. Then, so that's the critical thinking component, which is important in a SIM context. But then the thing about experience is the way we learn best is when we suffer consequences. Right, it's when we make mistakes. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we capture consequences. If you make a decision, then you should have to deal with it, good or bad, no mulligans, right? No back button, deal with it, and then see what happens as we progress over time. Because ultimately, uh, we, it's not just a decision that we wanna focus on in a sim, in an experience, it's actually a situation. Because sometimes consequences are not immediate. And so you wanna be able to create an environment in which we are in a context that we recognize, that we can see ourselves in, that we make decisions, that we experience consequences. And then at the end, we really want to be able to get some feedback, right? We need to be able to reflect. We need to be able to have that opportunity to think about what happened, why it happened, why it may not happen that way next time. And so to provide that opportunity for feedback. Now, ideally for us, and this is the last thing I'll say, is, the, um, is they should be done, if possible, with others. Because the whole idea of experience is I have my perspective and I will experience it in one way, but that's based on my past experience, my knowledge, my expertise, and that's great. But somebody, my peer, my colleague, my friend, or somebody I don't know, will have a whole different set of experiences that that is the lens that they view it. And that could be hugely insightful in terms of the way they look at things. And the only way I'm going to learn that is if they tell me. And so, you know, what we know about stories is as human beings, we love to engage with stories, but we also love to tell stories. That's how we process information. And if we can create an environment in which you're having an experience that provokes you 
to actually tell your stories, then what can be better than that? So for me, that's what a simulation, that's kind of the key components that I would look at in trying to create experience or manufacture it, so to speak, and what a simulation can be. Cool, thanks for kicking us off, Ken. Sarah, what do you wanna add? Well, I guess I would think, I'm gonna change um, gears a little bit and think of it in terms of preparation for leadership, but it's pertinent for teachers and for other professions as well. And, and call it virtual practicum experiences. So where can we create, um, as Ken referenced, scenarios, um, situations where the person has something that they have to interact with, some description of context that then prompts them to do something. So this experiential learning where the simulation or even the case, some of some scenarios can be delivered in a, a case environment, starts off a cycle of learning that then the instructor surrounds it with a whole bunch of other things that moves they make, right? To get people to reflect on the experience and what was it and what was it about? What did they learn? What were they evoked to do? Um, it gets them to think about, um, they're then asked to think about, well, how does that relate to what's being learned in their prof you know, professional setting or in their coursework? And then gets them to think prospectively forward. So what would you do next time? So I think um, thinking more broadly in terms of virtual practicum, so how can you situate learning inside of an experience so that you are developing practice, so that you are developing competence. And so when you go a little broader in that kind of definition, there's a couple of different kinds of products that I think fit in that, um, or packages, genres, let's say, that fit inside of that definition. For example, cases can serve as virtual practicum. Um, Text-based cases, but also digital cases. And that's something that I've been involved with for the last mm, almost 20 years, um, something called eTips cases that I developed for first teacher ed and then leadership ed. And um, those cases give people um, a setting and a prompt in which they have to imagine themselves. Um, Ken's um, work exemplifies simulations very um, that are responsive to the learner. So the learner does something and something else happens, right? And then um, we've been looking into some work by Ben Dotcher, um, clinical simulations, where it's actually role played. And that's done a lot in medical centers. And so um, all of these things simulate an environment, they simulate an experience which gets somebody to respond in a particular way. And ideally, of course, the, the learning design would have you setting that up in response to something that people are learning. Um, so I would define it in this broader way with a variety of genres of tools that can they may differ in two dimensions. If you think of a two by two diagram, how linear they are and how, whether they're responsive or not, or not rather. So traditional narrative cases are linear and static. They go from the beginning to the end of the story and nothing happens depending on the learner's response. Whereas um, digital simulations like um, Ken's work, um, and role plays like clinical sims where there's actually a standardized individual responding within a particular framing of experience. Those are both responsive and nonlinear. You're not sure how the storyline is gonna go, right? And then digital cases like the eTips cases that I've worked with over the years are static. They do not change the information presented according to what the learner does, but they are also nonlinear. And um, recently, some co-authors and I have um, written a paper where we talk about how each of those kinds of situations, whether you're in a linear or nonlinear, whether it's responsive or statics, ask different things of learners. It um, means that they have to bring different levels of tools to that learning experience and gets them to work cognitively in different ways. And so um, 
ultimately then these kinds of virtual practicums, <laughs> I think make thinking visible. And that's what, you know, helps us as teachers um, know what our students are thinking about as they encounter different contexts and see what they're bringing to their thinking and their, their imagined response, their virtual, you know, in this virtual setting. Gotcha. Ken and Sarah, thanks for the early intro. So both Punya and Chris have questions for you. I just want to squeeze one more in here for you real quick. So okay. give us a few examples of the kinds of things that we can simulate in education for teachers and administrators. Give us five or, five or six, you know, sort of example sims. Like what can we simulate? Ken, do you want to give some titles and examples from your work? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I often we are working presently in the leadership realm. So for sitting or aspiring leaders. And again, when you think about, you know, contextual issues, problems of practice, um, we can simulate on the mundane side of uh, having difficult conversations with a teacher, for instance, about how she's dressed or how he's dressed. Um, and if we're not used to difficult conversations, well, there you have it. It's not a difficult one, and yet it can be mm -hmm. uh, because of the context, the interrelationships, et cetera. Uh, then we can get a little bit more um, complicated and things like uh, dealing with a transgender student. Um, and the, what are the implications for the student, for the parents, for the staff, for the community? Um, how do you have these conversations? How do you balance the trade-offs? How do you balance the stakeholders that may be at play? Um, we may deal with issues like recognizing abuse or navigating a student's suicide. Things that we really don't want an administrator or a teacher to have to deal with for real the first time. Because the potential damage that one can do, we know, is pretty bad. And the amount that we can not we can't alleviate it, right? Because we're not going to get it all right. But at least we can try to work to minimize it as much as we can. And obviously, in the current environment, being able to deal with the with discussions around race, around equity, these are things which need to be had. They need to be had appropriately. But again, we don't want people practicing, if if you will, um, where the situation is going to have real people on the other side of that. Uh, without being able to be considerate of, again, you're not going to get it right. That's the problem with these issues is that there's not a right answer, but what we can do is do better. And this is an opportunity to do things like that or problems around those kinds of, of issues because they manifest in so many different contexts. You can't exhaust the opportunities. Thanks for a couple of examples, Ken. Is there anything else you want to add here before I turn it over to Punya? Yeah, I think that um, the kind of simulation or kind of virtual practicum that you're talking about each lends themselves to kind of really bring added value to different sorts of situations. And so um, the kinds of clinical sims and sims that um, Ken has, I think, are really great for seeing the consequence of your response and, you know, that kind of safe practice space that Ken was just referring to. Other kinds of sims um, or virtual practicum, like the digital cases that I mentioned, the topics there are more oriented towards helping a person frame a problem. And that's a different kind of thing that sims can be good for. And so, you know, these differences in their responsiveness and their linearity of the narrative, I think really lend themselves to different advantages, which then drive different stories. So the examples that you talked about, we have instructional leadership, relational leadership, and organizational leadership topics in ETIPS, for example. So sometimes you're doing problem finding about student um, subgroup achievement, for example, or instructional innovation, or planning professional development, or family and community engagement. So really you can ha make a sim about almost anything, um, but most importantly, isn't the sim, but what you're trying to evoke in the student, like what's the student model that this task is trying to get the student to the learning that you're trying to get them to express. Um, so there's a question.
question? Do, or should we yeah, just... no, I can I can jump in. Okay. Um, so I had a couple of questions. So the dimensions, uh, Sarah, that you mentioned, like linear and responsive, I think there's another dimension to Sims, which I think is really interesting. So I have a two part question. Um, so first part is this dimension of fidelity, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. How, you know, what is, how do we, um, you know, the, so that it should feel real. So that like, like Ken, that you said that the consequences should re feel real to get you into that, that space of, you know, whatever the problem or the situation is that you're dealing with. Like, what are, what are your thoughts about sort of how much fidelity is required? Does it need to be like really realistic or can you, because humans are very good at filling in the spaces, right? I mean, we can make a little sketch of a stick figure. I mean, XKCD does these amazing comics with just stick figures, right? Uh, but I mean, so I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, the dimensions around, around that dimension. When we talk about fidelity, what do we mean? The second question I had is, you know, we are meeting under the shadow of sort of COVID-19 and so on. And that's sort of a black swan event. So the question for leadership then becomes is how do we prepare them for situations which, uh, you know, you at least K-12 school districts could not have necessarily anticipated. Um, and how, how, do, how can simulations and sims play a role in that? So two part, one is around this dimension of fidelity. Um, and the second is around sort of these black swan events and how simulations can play a role, if they can play a role or how they can help with that. So I'll just mute myself and um, love to hear what you guys have to say. I'll take a stab at the fidelity question first and we'll, we'll take them in turn. How's that sound, Ken? Okay. Um, okay. So the fidelity issue, I think um, it's been shown in instructional design and Kirk might step in and give us a little bit of um, background and history on this topic um, that it isn't necessary for everything to look 100% realistic for people to be engaged with and immersed in a situation and for example, there's um, a program that uses like a mixed reality um, immersion. And we have people using that in teacher ed at my institution and they do heart rate monitoring and um, take samples of their saliva to see what their stress hormone is. And it engages them and they talk about it feeling really realistic and what they're seeing on the screen are cartoon figures. And so, you know, this idea that it has to be um, looking like humans and you need to be imagining everything is not true. I think once you are put in a scenario that has some fidelity to what's realistic um, for teacher ed, it might be classroom management issues. For leaders, it might be an angry parent. Um, and you're expected to engage. Um, you feel like it's very real. If I can jump in, I mean, there's this uh, studies done like back in the 40s with these abstract triangles and squares where they make these little movies. Um, you should look this up. It's fascinating um, that just these abstract things moving around and you ask people, what do you see? And they all talk about these long extended narratives about this person trying to save themselves from X and why they're being attacked by Y. Mm -hmm. And when you watch them, you can't help seeing those stories. So I think I, as humans, we are very good at being able to see, I mean, this comes back, I think, to Ken's point. So Ken, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it about sort of the, 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 the story-like element that is inherently quite attractive, I think, in these scenarios. Yeah. So, um, thank you. Uh, the, so we balance, right, fr from the standpoint of looking at this, right, we want the fidelity and we want to balance it with scalability, right, because it's important that they be usable. So um, we do like to, we do firmly believe, and I saw a, a question came up about VR, I, something came up at, at some point. And you know, when you think about you know, what, what fidelity means, are we talking about the fidelity of the tech? Or are we talking about the fidelity of the story? Um, so all of the, when we simulate, right, we want it to be based on somebody's experience, right? We want it to be authentic that as you said, that people can see themselves in the action, even if it's not about them. Um, and so, yes, they're making decisions. And again, in, in, as in, in Sarah's uh, continuum that um, she describes in terms of the different types of simulations, but if you're going to 
be able to engage in this practicum, which is going to be, we want it to be again, recognizable contextually, but not about you, right? Because we don't want people to get caught up in history of how things happened or how things are done in your particular place, because that may not always give you the right answer. So we want you to be able to feel like you're part of it, but still separate from it. So I personally have a, a bias, if you will. <laughs> Uh, I'm not a big fan of avatars, and that I recognize that as a bias that I have to contend with. Um, because So we use video and text because we like to harness the power of the imagination. We like to get it real enough that people begin to see themselves and are not distracted by what else is on the screen. And so from the standpoint of being able to do, to capture that kind of thing, so we work with practitioners based, so we have somebody who's actually coming from their experience. So it's not my building, but it could be. And these aren't my people, but they could be. And then be able to deploy it in a manner in which it can be done wherever, um, however, with whomever, um, so that it can be deployed from in that manner. And Ken, just to be clear, when you say you're trying to make it as realistic as possible, that means, for example, that you actually get a phone call in the sim or, a teacher actually walks into your office and talks to you about something and you see the teacher sitting in the chair across the desk from you, right? These kind of things. That is correct. So when Sarah mentioned the idea of nonlinearity, um, it's not just the responsiveness, but it's actually to capture the distractions. That, you know, there, there are a lot of things that when one looks at them in education that you look at them and say, this shouldn't be so complicated, right? There are a lot of issues that on their surface really seem pretty straightforward. And yet, they rarely present in a straightforward manner, right? We're either we're at our best or we are not distracted or we don't have six other things going on at the same time. And so we do wanna Im embed not to overcomplicate things, but to have it be that kind of, that things may come up to distract you, that things may get in the way or information may be presented, right? The, the old water cooler concept, right? Somebody sticks their head in your door all of a sudden in the middle of something else and all of a sudden it, that issue now gets rid of everything else that you were working on because that's gotta be focused on. Okay, that happens. And so I guess to, to your other, if I can transition, if you'll forgive me, Sarah, into your other question, Punya, in terms of thinking about the pandemic, yes, the black swans, we can't deal with the black swans because, well, they're black swans, but can we affect the critical thinking aspect of us as individuals, where we are, the muscle memory that we're creating is being thoughtful, right? Because that's why we don't, you know, we can't simulate everything exactly the way it is because you have to be able to respond. You may make a great decision and then some stakeholder who you didn't anticipate comes and rolls you over because you just didn't anticipate them and it just messes everything up. What do you do? So is the black swan the pandemic or is the black swan a board member or, you know, these are the kinds of things that we, they're not predictable other than the fact that they will happen. And so what we wanna be able to do is help you to have that muscle memory that says, don't just react. Or if your initial reaction is to do X, pause for a minute and validate it at least in your own head if not being able to talk to somebody else and then be able to you know, either have a more thoughtful response if that is appropriate in that situation or at least that if you do get called to the mat on the decision you made, that you can say, I thought about that and this is why I did it. I wanna add one thing to what Ken just um, answered that kind of piggybacks on it and um, talks about something that Scott, you raised in the chat regarding context. And let me try to tie this to your question, Punya. So you were asking about a very rare event, right? Um, that you could use a simulation to help a person plan for something that hopefully will be very rare. I can think of other things like school shootings or someone having a heart attack or some kind of situation that is really not what we wanna see people have to um, deal with in real life very often, but they do happen. So those kind of rare events but also as um, can be then simulated to help people get some practice in reacting. But I think more importantly is preparing people through varying context 
to see like how does the the ideal behavior how does the competency develop where they have an understanding and they know how to enact it and they see how to adjust it in varying contexts so you can give people the same sort of scenario to respond to and set it in very different contexts. For example, that's what we do with the ETIPS cases. We have suburban, urban, and rural schools, high performing, low performing, middle performing. And with practice, people could see, oh, I understand what it means to do instructional leadership. But when you're starting with a school that's here in terms of parent involvement, um, teacher collaboration, materials available versus a school that starts over here with all of those things, you're your resources available to you as a leader, your first moves, the things that you're going to have to put in place as process and so forth are going to change. And I think that's exactly what all of these kinds of practice opportunities let you do is see the importance of context. It lets you plan for the rare event. I mean, ultimately, you're talking about people getting opportunities, fail safe environment opportunities to perform. But also one thing that hasn't come up is the like if you think of the simulation the virtual practicum as the donut hole <laughs> the hole in the donut around that is the instructional design that has to happen right so when a person performs and something happens how do they get feedback on that how do they process it as an experience because that's how they're going to learn from the experience right and well, I have another point kind of related to that, but I'll stop because I think we'll be able to bring it up later. So I'll jump in um, and I want to go back to uh, the very useful framing that the two of you provided earlier between simulations in which you have to figure out what the problem is. Because you may not even perceive that there is a problem. We see that all the time in education that there's a problem that you have to learn to recognize or simulations where there's an apparent problem and it may be the real problem or it may not be the real problem it may be a symptom so you're you're also having to learn from that and in both cases it seems to me there is a question about what sarah was saying repetition and variation so uh, in the ecosystems curricula that we build, in which you are dealing with simulated ecosystems, we are, we are helping learners to understand what to pay attention to, what's really salient from an expert's point of view. Um, in, in law, you present people, lawyers to be, with situations that are almost identical. They look the same, but actually, as a lawyer, you would use two different legal principles. And so you're learning that. In flight simulation, where the problem is apparent, um, maybe first you practice in which the engine fails on a clear day and you're high up in the sky. And then you practice when there's a thunderstorm and the engine is struck by lightning. And then you practice the Sully simulation where you're taking off and you go into a flock of birds and now you're not way up in the air. So how, how much do you find you can engage people in what they might view as repeating? Oh, I get it. You know, I did fine. And also, um, do you have principles that you use in deciding how to choose the variations that people are confronting? Those are great questions. And I'll tell you like what we did in eTips and what the student reactions were regarding that. I've done this, this is repetitive. So um, changing the context from rural to urban to suburban, we all know as educators, long time in the field, like those things matter low performing, middle performing, high performing, what characterizes that in terms of organizational um, capacity and learning and teacher collaboration, you know, what characterizes those different levels, those things matter a lot, right, for what a leader is going to do, what a teacher needs to start on with on focusing. All of that matters tremendously. Some of those finer points are not 
going to be as obvious to novices, which is why you want to present that to them, right? But it's, again, the instructional framing all the way around the experience that's going to get a reaction that's not like, I did this already. Why do I have to do another one? You know, what's different about it? And, um, you know, I've had eager uh, professors who assign multiple cases and students kind of withered under the, you know, lack of seeing the relevant differences among them. And also I've seen it done very well where um, it takes the instructor really drawing attention to context to help people, you know, figure out what's pertinent about it. But I think what another thing that you're, what you're hinting at then is the creator. And I'm seeing some of the chat questions roll up about how accessible are these and so forth. And to be honest, in ed leadership, there's very few of these sorts of tools available. Ken's work is the only simulation that we could find evidence of in the literature that's still available, that you could still use it. There's some that were created and they were a project and then they kind of died, you know, and ETIPS cases is available, but there were other digital cases that were created that then kind of died. Um, you know, they're grant funded or whatever. So you have a limited number of these and then you are further at the mercy of the designer, right? So what did they build in sort of to the any game, you know, any kinds of things. It has a set of operating principles, like persons are rewarded by to do this and they're they're punished or it seems less good to make another choice, right? And I think that to me is a critically important question when we talk about using these for learning, because we are in, there's implicit theory and framing built into the creation of the narrative, whether they're responsive or non, you know, or linear, they are going to have um, some kind of point of view built into it. And so the instructors have to know what that is and then also understand like, what are the opportunities to show varied context and to point that out, whether people are comparing it to their own school, to where they're doing field experiences, to the different case that somebody else in the class got. So there's an incredible number of important instructional moves that I just wanna keep emphasizing that have to surround these for learning to, to result from them. Can I chime in? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a great question. And one of the things that um, drives us is, uh, you know, for me, I've been doing simulations for over 30 years. And if we know that experience is the best teacher, and we know that simulations approximate experience from the examples that you mentioned in healthcare, in the military, aviation, then why isn't everybody simulating? This literally, I mean, this definitely keeps me up at night. So I don't, I don't get it. I mean, it seems so obvious and yet it's not. And so what I, uh, you know, hypothesize is, and this is uh, part of the course I teach at uh, the Graduate School of Education at Penn, University of Pennsylvania, is the idea that if you think about it, um, instruction and learning, I believe, have become synonymous. And so we tend to look at everything through an instructional lens, if you will. And yet we learn, when you think about how we learn from instruction and from experience, those are two different learning models at play, right? When we teach in whatever form, right, we tell you the right way of things. We tell you what you, the best way to do it. This is the process to follow, right? It's well, it's well framed and defined, and that's how we convey it. And we do it in all kinds of very interesting ways. And that manifests where even quote unquote experiential learning is built around best practices. That's great, and, and, and they're wonderful opportunities. But the thing is, is that when it comes to experience, our best learning opportunities actually come from making mistakes, come from failing. So whereas you wouldn't design instruction for fail with failure in mind, you do design experience with failure in mind, and therefore you should design them differently. So when you incorporate experience, what we're simulating is not an issue per se, we're simulating time. Right, And so the, well, we're simulating a period of time in the life of somebody, whoever the protagonist is, and they're dealing with, they're gonna walk down this timeline and deal with the issues as they play out and as issues play out on that timeline. Which means that, first of all, it's not about getting it right. So when somebody is um, having, a student has played a sim, 
they may want to go back. In fact, they often do want to go back and play it again because they want to see what would happen if. And they can play the whole situation and see what would happen. Well, I played it the first time. It's human to want to do it right. So we try to do the best answers. But maybe I want to try and screw up. I want to see what would happen if I made a mistake. What would happen if I got it wrong? What could happen? What might that look like? And I can then live that path. Um, you know, the responsive pathway will have negative consequences in a particular context, right? Which may then provoke me. The other aspect of that is if I experience something that makes no sense to me, if I'm engaged, then there's the opportunity for me to converse with somebody else, whether it's a colleague who I'm playing with, whether it's a coach or mentor, whether it's my instructor, whatever it's blended with. And I can ask, I wasn't, this shouldn't have happened. And then I can ask, why not? Because if my goal is not to assess your performance and not to see that you got it right, but actually to provoke critical thinking, then I'm forcing you to think about it. Why is my situation different than what's in the sim? And if I'm engaged, which is a key question, then I'm gonna be, that's constructive dissonance as opposed to destructive. And the one other thing I would wanna put in, you know, off of what Sarah had said, is the simulations also benefit from the power of framing, right? Since we're not simulating a specific issue, I can frame a sim in a manner in which it wasn't necessarily intended, right? So if we did a sim on uh, dealing with a, a challenge on a playground with a, an angry parent uh, relative to a student, if I set up as the instructor with the student, I want you to think about the equity issues that are at play in this simulation. I want you to think about the ethical considerations that are at play in the simulation. Now the student is coming into the exercise with that frame in mind, and that's going to drive the experience that they have. We can't help it, right? We are subject to framing. And now all of a sudden, even if I may have seen it before, I'm now seeing it differently. And so you have enormous flexibility in terms of how you utilize these and how students can benefit from them um, based on the objectives that you, what, what experience do I need you to have and have it um, play out in that manner. So Sarah and Ken, it strikes me that both of you are talking a lot about the power of simulations within a facilitated context, right? Like it's not just like when my kid sits down and plays a video game, you're talking about a community of conversation and discussion. You have a facilitator who's doing framing, who's unpacking sort of metacognitive thinking, right? And that is seems in many ways as important as the sim itself. Um, For sure. Right, so how do we, um, but the sim itself is also important. I think one of the things we're hearing about from our audience is they have questions about things like creator bias or the diversity of the people who make these, right? Somebody's referencing algorithms of oppression and so on. So how do we address some of that? Because we can't take care of all of that through facilitation. Well, um, these are issues to be concerned about. I think all materials that people want to use, they should subject them to a, a sort of equity audit. You know, what's the representation? What's the implicit messages? Because there are, I mean, a creator has to put some way that things work into the simulation, into the case, then whether it's a narrative that's linear or nonlinear, what are you going to get if you do this or that? Okay. So it should get examined. First of all, if it's teaching, letting students learn what you want them to learn um, and learn about and reflect on. But um, we have so few of the materials that um, I think getting more of them and getting more created, more materials created, getting more people creating them and, and choosing to use them is the first problem before we um, eliminate the two viable products that are on the market right now. You know, um, it's too bad. I'd love to see more choices. I wanted to, if I could just take a little slight bird walk, I have an interesting story to tell, I think, around why aren't more people using these, okay? Somebody wrote that. And um, so I recently helped um, UCA, which is the University Council of Educational Administration. It's the lead professional organization in our field. It was housed at UVA and it moved recently to Michigan State. And um, I was uh, took charge of 
documenting all the work on simulations that had been done from 1960 to 2000. And for a long period of time, those 40 years, UCA was very involved in creating simulations. And because of the era, almost all of them were paper-based, creating activities that people would do, engage in um, assessment center-like work. Sometimes that's what it was called. Other times they had an elaborate background information that was actually from a school that was made um, anonymized. And you know, trying to get people to do real kinds of administrative work. And um, then around 2000, that work was no longer engaged in by UCA. And simulations, it seems, have somewhat fallen off um, in this field. And um, I think that that, meanwhile, lately, teacher ed has been taking off with all kinds of different tools that they are using. And so um, this idea of why aren't they used is a combination of who's getting funding, who's making them, or who's entrepreneurial enough like Ken to actually create a business out of it. Because as you know, professors don't really have those skills. Some do, <laughs> I don't. Um, but uh, this idea of people have seen for a long time we need tools like this, but creating them, funding it, bringing it to market and sustaining the upkeep of them, making them sustainable, paying for those hosting costs, et cetera. You know, there those things are not exactly always easy to do. And I think that's one issue is having more products in the marketplace. Um, and I was intrigued to see this rich 40 year history in Ed and Min, and then to see now today so few things um, available. Um, but the second part, I think, is also changing how people teach. Um, it is a big difference to provide people these experiences to provide individual feedback and so on. And so the second part of my little story is that we recently did a survey of all preparation programs for leadership in the um, principal prep in the US. And um, we found that, uh, you know, lots of people use cases and lots of people use field experiences as they should, but there's very little, um, you know, stuff in the middle of this continuum as you work your way from text and lec lecture, text-based cases, digital cases, and so on over into the internship field experience very little of the stuff in the middle, probably in part because there's not that many choices, but also um, I don't think people understand it as a pedagogy. So. so if I could, that's great, thank you. I mean, I love that continuum. And if, if you haven't seen um, Sarah's, that would be a great graphic to send out as a resource um, that Sarah had put together in terms of the, that, the continuum of, of activity that can go from learning through um, live application but you know, to to your question, Scott, you know, first of all, Sims can. It's important from our uh, approach that Sims be blended, right? We need instruction. We need learning from instruction, and we also need to learn from experience. They need to be. We need both. Neither is more important than the other. They're both important, and it's best when they're blended together, uh, because the experience gives you the opportunity to apply what you have learned or to discover what you don't know. And now you're a motivated learner. And so you create a much more robust learning process if it's framed in that way. Now that ideally, if you have a facilitator, that's great. But sometimes we need to do things asynchronously. Sometimes the, the limitations of maybe we've got a rural district or maybe you've got an inability, I don't know, something like a pandemic happens and you can't travel and get together anymore. Um, and we need to be able to have the opportunity to do this well, it still should be done in some kind of blended way and not blended in terms of necessarily content, but blended in terms of modality. So if somebody goes through it, if there's a frame and assignment that helps people to think about having an experience about what, or in what context are you having this experience? Um, that's always gonna be helpful. And if they can submit an assignment and you, you'd be surprised, we've always, I continue to be amazed at how willing people are to do manual assignments in the context of being in an experience. So being able to actually do more work because you're a motivated learner, you'll do whatever makes sense. If I need to, if I, you know, we're, if we free form writing where you can submit an answer, people do it at, at, at a pretty good clip in terms of, and they, and they take the submission seriously, even when they know it's not being graded. 
And so because we're engaged in the exercise, it can manifest in the, as a motivated learner into a variety of things. So there's, you know, the blended component is important, but asynchronous can work also um, in, in terms of the power of the modality. But the other aspect I did want to respond to in terms of the nature of the designers, from our standpoint, what we bring to the table is the ability to simulate. What we simulate is going to be through the lens of whoever we work with. So that's how we get the diversity, which is because we want to get not just the issues that may be about diversity, but the perspectives of the individuals that are experiencing those things. Because sometimes it's not just the challenge of the issue itself, but it's also dealing with the challenge of how you're perceived as an individual, which could be a gender, it could be race, it could be a variety of things. And so you not only have to deal with the issue, which again is complicated enough, but what about when it goes on top of that, you have to deal with this other stuff and getting practice with that again, because deer in the headlights is never gonna be a good option. Then the opportunity to actually have that experience under your belt, whether it's your life or whether it's you experiencing somebody else's experience. You know, we don't necessarily, I don't know about this, a whole nother question, can you teach empathy? But I can actually help you to understand another person's experience. Now, if that creates empathy or it just helps you to see get a healthy respect for what the potential consequences are so that if you're afraid of it, okay, it may not be empathy, but it sure looks like it. Then those are the kinds of things that we wanna be able to do, but also to make sure that as much as possible, we capture those that the diversity of experience, the diversity of the individuals. Um, again, because the participants are gonna be from everywhere and anywhere uh, to be able to um, have to deal with the issues. So we co-founded Silver Lining for Learning because we felt that in the middle of this terrible human tragedy, there were opportunities, the silver lining. And in particular, there were opportunities to become better by using technologies that, as you said, people haven't used for a long time and now they're being brought to the forefront distance education is being brought to the forefront. We believe games and simulations are being brought to the forefront. So in about six weeks, I'm hosting a second episode on, on games and simulations from a little different perspective. Um, now, a question that's coming up, understandably, is about licensure. Because at Harvard, we have teacher licensure and principal licensure. We have people in the pipeline. They're not able to do their face-to-face -face experience that ordinarily would be required. Uh, and it's not really fair to them to hold them up. So the question is, how do we warrant that they know enough to receive a license? And this is being asked of all kinds of simulations. So I, I am an advisor to immersion and I have thought a lot about digital puppeteering. What kind of warrants can you give from that? What kind of warrants can we give from agent-based simulations or from uh, materials-based simulations that are, that are more about framing? So I'm just curious if, if somebody said to you, um, you know, here's, here's $20 million, uh, can you make a set of simulations where in an unusual situation like this, where you can't get the warrant face to face, you would feel comfortable licensing somebody. I'm just, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm curious as to what you would say. And in particular, what you feel you could warrant and what you feel maybe is a little shaky in terms of being able to warrant. Mm -hmm. well, do you mind if I go, Sarah? So I, one of the things we have experienced is that, um, you know, in the current environment that, that people are using the sims to at least approximate to some degree, right? If the sites are closed, then how do we actually have experience? But, but the sims themselves are not sufficient, right? Although I'd love a check for $20 million and we could do some really serious stuff. You know, I, I don't know that that's, you know, we don't need that um, kind of investment simply because I, I do think that it's important from a licensure or from a measurement perspective that 
you know, it, to have the appropriate perspective on what it is we're measuring, right? If we, we cannot, I don't believe, simulate every situation you're going to be in, right? That's not doable. And nor can we ask a question in which we will, based on your response, I'll know that you can extrapolate from the lesson to dealing with that, whatever that might be. So when we combine those elements though, and if we can create something that's realistic enough, right, that puts you in the role and has you making decisions and dealing with blowback and dealing with consequences as they play out in a situation. Again, not just a scenario, but a series of, of scenes laid out together. So you're dealing with a, that period of time. Then we can provoke the thinking from how would you apply this in your, so we can create the frame for the assignment is to get your licensure. Tell me how you would do this in your building, whatever that may be and why. And if we can begin to you know, get an understanding from them that they perceive the nuance, they perceive the contextual elements that are at play, they perceive the, the relationships that they're contending with that often get, that either help us or get in the way of our doing things and being able to then also get it right in terms of knowing, right? There's some really valuable content that they've been taught. Are they actually using it or able to apply it in a manner in which Right, like you said, the example, Chris, in, in, in the law, right? So you have two situations, um, but different applications of the law. Okay, well, can, you, can we see that in your application in the building, whether it's as a teacher or an administrator? And so being able to create that environment, even asynchronously and remotely, I think is a possibility. And again, I'm not a licensing body, um, so I can't speak to the exacts of that, but in terms of our discussions with those who are, that there is an opportunity to actually um, go in that direction and utilize these modalities to uh, help to achieve that. I want to weigh in. I'm going to give a different perspective. I think, Chris, what you're talking about is not designing a simulation, it's designing an assessment, right, which is a different situation. So then the task that's given, which would be the simulation as in this context that we're discussing today, you know, you'd have to know both what is your student model, what's the thing that you're trying to get uh, people to demonstrate proficiency on, the simulation would be designed to evoke that, and then you'd have to know how you're going to score it and what those artifacts are, and that can total, totally be done. We do that in NAEP, there's a, you know, we've done that with um, ICILS, the International um, Computer and Information Literacy Test. Like there have been plenty of SIMs that are created for assessment purposes. And I want to also say like in comparison to what we have now, right? Because people who go out and do their student teaching or their uh, leadership prep internship, they're not subjected to every environment and every opportunity and every sort of thing. And they get a pretty protected experience, right? They're supposed to show beginning level competency in a variety of ways. And also in Virginia, at least, this is what happened this spring, um, you know, COVID, everything shut down about mid-March. We only had about, um, oh, maybe a month left of the semester before things were pretty done. So most people had their hours in. In fact, our state asked us to find out who, you know, who doesn't have the majority of their hours. And they allowed us to propose things like simulations as alternative ways for people to close the gap and finish up their last hour. Sorry, my cat just jumped up. Um, and so this summer, though, we just had a meeting and uh, direction from the state that people had to be placed with in-person um, supervisors. So that wasn't going to be allowed until maybe it's not possible. And then they might make that shift, right? So like they're going back to the default of everybody goes and gets placed with a person. That's what will count. You can't do substitutions until maybe it's not possible to do that because there is this thing. So I think in, in theory, like, yes, you can build assessments that deter, that are around a simulation that give you you know, they have good construct validity, they good predictive validity, they would work. And there is 
a case-based um, SLLA is the thing that most states use for licensure for administrators. And so, yeah, this is possible. Would we be comfortable with it? I don't think so. That's a different question. So Ken and Sarah, I know that you all use a lot of uh, simulations with both pre-service and also in-service educators, right? So it might be on the preparation side, you're a novice trying to become more familiar with what it means to take on that role as a teacher, as a principal, whatever. But also for educators who are in their current context in terms of refining their practice, figuring out how to think more deeply or richly about what they do to come to some collective agreements about sort of how to respond in different scenarios, right? As opposed to each of us being sort of lone actors, right? Um, and so those are all really powerful uses. It strikes me as we were talking about um, using it for sort of assessment or licensure that it would also be an interesting usage to have a supervising educator along with the pre-service educator, right? Where the pre-service educator walked through their choices within a simulation and then the supervising educator, you know, the cooperating teacher, the supervising principal, whatever, for the pre-service student was then giving feedback on that response before they then clicked on the next button to see what the simulation said. And right, sort of this mutual unpacking of the scenario with somebody who's entrusted with sort of your growth and development as an educator would be another sort of really interesting use. Um, I think that's again the instructional design that surrounds it. That's a great idea. That was one of the suggestions we gave our interns, you know, sit down and do one of Ken's simulations with your supervisor and talk it through. I think that's a great learning opportunity um, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So Kurt's heading back in to introduce next week's guests. Just want to say thank you, Sarah and Ken, for giving us sort of an initial um, invitation and exposure to this concept of simulations and how we can think about them, what some of those possibilities and silver linings are. Um, I'm going to note and sort of reiterate what Chris said that we have an upcoming episode in a few weeks from now. Yeah. We're going to talk about it more from the student and teacher side. Um, and I know that most of Ken's experience and Sarah's experience has been more in sort of, you know, businesses or the outside world or leaders or so on. So we're going to get sort of a second look at simulations and games in a few cool. weeks. It'll be really great. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Kurt, if you want thank to you. Thank you. coming up next week, that would be great. And then we'll sign off. Quinn, you want to start and I'll help you? Sure. Uh, so next week we have uh, excited to have two educators uh, from Israel joining us. Uh, the two are Mary Schoenfeld and Eli Schmeli. And um, I've known both of them for a while. And Miri is one of sort of an international leader in the area of teacher education and technology. Some of the stuff that she's been doing more recently around uh, intercultural knowledge and tolerance is actually quite amazing given you know the the geopolitically where israel is located um ellie is uh, heads is the director of the inter university center for e learning which is um, as a sort of a networking organization between 20 academic colleges and all of Israel's eight universities, particularly focusing on technology and online learning and so on. And you can imagine with the COVID-19 that became sort of became like an absolutely important component of Israel's response. Uh, Miri does a lot of work both internationally and within Israel around teacher prep. I don't think there's anybody in Israeli education system who doesn't know Miri. Uh, so really excited to have uh, both of them uh, with us next week. Um, I know Israel opened their schools and that led to a spike. So I'm sure there will be updates from them just on these sort of issues on the ground. Kurt, anything else you want to add? I have a, had the luxury of visiting Israel about 15 years ago and going to Miri's uh, place and um, being part of the Moffitt Center conference a couple of times. And also Miri is listening right now. If she stayed up, she was with us when we started. It's a lot, it's late at night or early That's morning right. in Israel. She might have gone to bed, but I want to welcome her this week and next week. I, I ran downstairs to try and get a copy of this book, but I see I don't have it. It's her newest book, Collaborative Learning in the Global World, a volume on literacy, language, and learning, uh, edited volume. Uh, she is, she's gotten President Award from Israel, Ministry of Education Awards. Um, she's in charge of the Technology, Education, and Cultural Diversity Center of the, the Moffitt Institute. 
as well as ICT head at Kabutsum College of Education. So she's been to the US many times and she, maybe she'll visit uh, all of you. Um, and as Punya says, she travels the world to ignite ideas and discussion about technology and education. I look forward. Thank to you, guys.